real crazy day in sports, especially in New York sports, as you had a general manager get fired, a soon-to-be owner back out of a deal, and then nationally you had a big-time trade in baseball with Mookie Betts getting traded to the Los Angeles Dodgers. But we will do this in chronological order before I start again, RIP to Kobe and Gigi and all the others involved in crash. But let's get to Steve Mills being fired by the New York Knicks after they have had a really, really rough season. And you know what? When they fired David Fisdale early in the year, I had read that I felt like he got a bit of a raw deal. It was kind of unfair because of the pieces that he is working with. I just felt like he doesn't really have much to work with. With the roster they have, it's very hard to make that a winning team. And the other problem I had with getting rid of David Fisdale was the lack of alternatives. I know everybody wants a Mark Jackson or maybe they want to go outside the box and get a Chris Mullen or you want to get Van Gundy back. You hear the same names over and over and over. But none of these teams ever decide to hire these guys. I don't know if the Knicks are going to be the ones to do that. We'll see what happens. I mean, the former player in Mark Jackson, the former coach in Van Gundy you know, for that organization. I'm not really sure if something like that is going to happen. But... It is worth considering. I mean, who knows who they eventually will hire to replace Mike Miller. And Miller has done a pretty good job. When he first took over, the Knicks were definitely improving compared to how they played under, under Fisdale. But now they're kind of playing more like the uh, Knicks from before, which is just a really bad team and losing game after game. I know they won the game last night barely against you know a really bad Cleveland Cavaliers team. Marcus Morris is having a career season. And you know, he made some big shots that allowed them to defeat the Cavaliers. And one of the big things is this whole idea of do you trade Marcus Morris, do you not trade Marcus Morris. And from the perception that I get, uh, it was something that the Knicks had been talking about. Like, you know, do we do it, do we not do it? I don't know if maybe Mills and Perry and other guys' organization were arguing about that. But to me and a lot of other Knicks fans, no doubt about it, you have to trade Marcus Morris. I mean, he's not going to be a guy that's a long-term solution. He's not. He'll help you win a couple more games here and there, but... When you look at the Knicks' current record at 15-36, and 36, I mean, they're only a couple games away from having the worst record in all of basketball. I mean, you have the Warriors at 12 wins, and you have the Hawks at 13, and the Cavaliers, they just beat last night at 13. So it's very easy to get that, you know, worst record in basketball again. And here's the thing, the Knicks wasted all of last year purposely getting the worst record in all of basketball to give them a really good chance at trying to get the number one pick in order to draft Zion Williamson. And for Fisdale, I still think it's unfair to criticize him off that season when the Knicks were purposely trying to lose. And it's what the fans wanted. So, I mean, Fisdale gave the Knicks fans what they wanted, and that was to lose. And my big problem with what happened today for the Knicks is the rumors of their potential interest in Masa Ajiri. Now, there's nothing wrong with Masa. We obviously know he's a great general manager with the Toronto Raptors, even if I'm not saying his name right. Still, I don't like that the Knicks are once again star chasing and they're trying to rely on stars instead of finding the right guys, the under the radar people, not only within the organization, but also with the players. Some people are talking about Sam Presti as well from Oklahoma City. He came from the Spurs organization, a tremendous general manager, had his controversial moves, you know, James Harden leaving and Duran and Paul George. So, I mean, Oklahoma City, they've gone through every star you pretty much could go through, it seems like. But... No matter what, that team does win games. It is competitive. I mean, you want to talk about a rebuilding team. When Oklahoma City traded Paul George and Russell Westbrook, they're supposed to be a rebuilding team. But as of right now, they currently have the number seven seed in the Western Conference. And they're playing much better than people thought they were going to. And they have young up-and-coming players like Ashai Gillagis Alexander. And he's going to be someone that might end up turning to be the Oklahoma City franchise point guard. But he's not a big-time name. So I think for the Knicks, they have to stop with the star chasing because... They traded Christoph Porzingis, who was one of their top draft picks. And was supposed to turn to be a really good player. Has not happened yet. Don't know if it's going to. But the main reason they did that was to free up the cap space to try to get big-time players. I mean, last year we had a really great free agency class that made for a really good offseason and what has made, in turn, for a good basketball season, hopefully a good postseason as well, just because of the competitive balance. And there were so many stars out there on the free agent market that teams, they were just getting stars here and stars there and combining them. The Clippers, I mentioned Paul George, him joining Kawhi Leonard, and you had the Lakers acquiring Anthony Davis and Kemba Walker going to the Boston Celtics. We saw the Brooklyn Nets. Where are they? They're over here. We saw the Brooklyn Nets get Kyrie Irving 
and Kevin Durant, even though Kyrie's hurt and, and Durant's been hurt all year. So that hasn't worked out perfectly. But still, we saw a lot of stars bounce around. Jimmy Butler has made a big difference for the Miami Heat. So, again, we saw a lot of star players moving around. And the Knicks just said to themselves, you know, with all these superstars out there and we're the Knicks, we should be able to get at least one of them. That was not the case. The Knicks struck out on everybody. They didn't get any big sign players. So they kind of were in scramble mode. And they got a bunch of veterans, you know, Marcus Morris and a guy like Taj Gibson and Reggie Bullock and Wayne Ellington. Took some risky deals, trying to get some upside with some younger players like Julius Randle and Bobby Portis. The Knicks got way too many power forwards in the offseason for me. That's a big reason why they can't win any games. But you definitely have got to trade Marcus Morris because you're in a situation now where you don't have any players so far that's like, okay, well, at least we have this guy. We know we can build on them. We're going to get to the Mets later. And about how it's like, okay, well, you have Pete Alonso, you have McNeil, you have DeGrom. So you have some really good pieces. There's other guys I'll get to later. I don't want to, you know, not count anybody in. But for the Knicks, you don't really have any players that you're like, okay, well, we have this guy. We know they're a big time player, someone we can count going forward. Mitchell Robinson, I would say, is a guy you can count on, but he's not the first, second, or third best player on a championship team. And I, I think that's something you really have to be considerate of because one of the rumors that I saw today was the Knicks' potential interest in Kyle Kuzma. Now, the thing with Kuzma, like Mitch Robinson, he's not the best player on the championship team. He's not the second best player on the championship team. And if he does decide to stay with the Lakers, we'll find out if he can be the third best player on the championship team. And that is if you have two top 10 players in LeBron James and Anthony Davis, which is extremely difficult to do. And the thing that really bothers me with Nick fans is after missing out on all these big time star players, the way they continue to resort to this, you know, unreal scenario, they keep dreaming about these stars and saying, oh, well, Giannis is going to be a free agent soon. Maybe we could sign him. Like, no, that is not the right mindset to go with. You have to continue to try to find younger players. You have to trade Marcus Mars or whatever other players you have to to get assets. And you got to try to find these under the radar players that all of a sudden can become franchise players. And I think the very interesting thing about Mitchell Robinson, him being a second round draft pick, not a top guy like a Kristaps Porzingis or a Kevin Knox or an RJ Barry. Like he was not one of the top guys. And so far, he's the guy that's most, you know, reliable for the Knicks because RJ Barrett, he's been banged up. Mixed results. Kevin Knox has been extremely consistent. And my biggest criticism of Mike Miller, especially if it happens after the trade deadline, because as of right now, the Knicks have not made any moves. They still have Marcus Morris on the team and Ellington and Bullock and Taj Gibson and Bobby Porras and Juice Randall. These guys that really shouldn't be here long term, but they have maintained all of them. So the problem that I've had with the Knicks all year is how much they have played these veteran guys. I think that is such a big mistake, especially because you haven't even been winning. Like, if you're going to play all your veterans, you do that with the intention of winning. The fact that you're still losing and Frank Nellikina is not developing and Kevin Knox isn't developing and, you know, Mitchell Robinson, his playing time is kind of, you know, sparse. And you're just not developing the young players as much as you should. You have to give these guys much more of a try so that they have more experience and they can become better players. And then more importantly, for an organization, you you find out if these are players that you want to have in the long run. So that is my biggest criticism of Mike Miller is how much he is playing these runs and these young guys are getting no minutes. So I just think that is a major mistake because you can still lose all you want to, but you want to find some bright spots. You want to find some reasons for hope. And I just think that if these younger players, you know, like Anel Aquina and Knox and guys like that, if they can show some improvement and be competent NBA players, then you're off to something. One of the guys that stands out to me in the trade market, I mean, uh, it's going to be tough and it's risky, but I liked him in the offseason and I still like him now because of his position. And that's D'Angelo Russell. I mean, he played really well for the Brooklyn Nets. He was the main reason why they're able to get into the postseason. I just like that even if Kenny Atkinson had put him on the bench, he still was very supportive of his team. He was willing, even though he took some crazy shots, he made a lot of them. He has the ability to erupt. He was an all-star last season. He's dealt with a lot of injuries this season on a really bad Golden State team. And it's just so mind-boggling. I mean, this is the way sports can change at the snap of a finger. And we're going to talk about that later with the Boston Red Sox. But think about the Golden State Warriors. They were a team there in the finals every year. Prohibited favorites to win the championship. It was the Warriors. It was the Warriors. It was the dynasty. They're the best things in sliced bread. They're light years ahead of other organizations. They're such this amazing team. They currently have the worst record in basketball. And that happened within the span of a year. So it's just really crazy how quickly basketball could change like that. So all of a sudden, D'Angelo Russell finds himself on the worst team in basketball record-wise. We'll talk about injuries. The Warriors have dealt with more than anybody. Steph Curry missing time. Klay Thompson is still out. You know, obviously, D'Angelo Russell has been banged up. So you know, the Warriors... 
because they are not the same team that they had been those past few years when they were in that dynasty mode. So I think that D'Angelo Russell, he's worth it because it is just so hard to get all these top tier point guards because the way I look at it is that you, Steph Curry is not coming to the Knicks. Russell Westbrook as it comes to the Knicks, Kyrie Irving, Kemba Walker, Damian Lillard, Luka Doncic. I mean, uh, all these other really good point guards that are in the NBA, they're not coming to the Knicks. So since you're not going to get them, you have to get a good point guard, which the Knicks still have not been able to do. I mean, the Knicks have not been able to do that for a long time. They have not had a franchise point guard. The best point guard they've had this decade is Lynn Sandy, which was like a month or two of a pretty good Jeremy Lin, you know, not even all-star caliber. So, I mean, it's definitely been a revolving door at the point guard position. The Knicks have had a lot of veterans. You think of Chauncey Billups and Jason Kidd, the, Raymond Felton. I mean, solid players, don't get me wrong, but not franchise point guards, not guys that you build your team around or are the franchise point guard, a guy that's starting for you when you are in the playoffs and is a point guard that you can rely on. And it's just so important that in this current NBA where there are so many star point guards, you need someone that can match up with them and that could, you know, hang with them. And it's like, if Kemba's going to give you 30 points, you need D'Angelo to match up with 30 points. I, I just think that's something that is very important for a team like the Knicks if you want to become a winning team. And like I said, is Kuzma the best player in championship team? Is Mitchell Robinson the best player in championship team? Can D'Angelo Russell be the best player in championship team? Absolutely not. Could he be the second best player? I don't think so. Third best? Hopefully. You know what I mean? So again, it's like you would have to give up assets. You would have to take on a big contract. But again, it's just like the Knicks. I mean, they have cap space. And the thing is that like, do they, you know, play the lottery again? Are they going to actually hit the number one pick? And will they take a point guard? Will there be a franchise point guard out there for them? We really don't know yet. So I just think that if you have a chance to get a pretty good point guard, you try. I just think that D'Angelo Russell can at least be the first step in trying to build a better team. So if I'm the Knicks, I got to stop with the star chasing. I have to stop thinking about Giannis. I have to stop thinking about Masai Jury or Sam Presti. You have to be realistic. You have to build from within. You have to develop your guys. And you have to trade the current players that you have and get more assets. So you have more draft picks to get more young players to see if they're going to be quality players going forward. So that is my takeaway from this whole firing that happened with the Knicks. Now let's get to the Mets. This one, I mean, really took me by surprise because we knew that the Knicks were going to have to make changes because how bad things were going. They had a lot of embarrassing losses lately. Think of the Memphis game that happened a couple games ago. That definitely was a big crush. And they've had so many just ugly blowouts and just bad things all around that have happened this season. But for the Mets, I mean, everybody was going crazy about, oh, Steve Cohen is going to take over and no more Will Ponds. You know, the emperor has been overthrown. You know what I mean? Darth Vader threw Palpatine over the balcony, something like that. But all of a sudden, now it's not really the case because this report that Steve Cohen could be potentially backing out of the deal. And what really drove me crazy about this was the reasoning for that. And the report is, I believe it was from the Post that had it, and there was another business writer that had it. I don't have all the exact you know credit for it. But still, this idea that Cohen backed out because the Mets, the Wilpons, were changing the terms of the deal at the last minute. And Cohen did not like that, so he said, you know what? If you're going to play funny business, I'm out. Goodbye. You're not getting my billion dollars. I'm putting it right back in my pocket. And I'm taking my business somewhere else. And I just think that that was so crazy because I've said it before. I've actually said it a lot because I think it's something that's really important to be mindful of. The Met fans are having a big time reliance on Steve Cohen. They're expecting Steve Cohen to be the savior and completely change the narrative about the Mets and change the whole organization by making big time moves. When you think of Mookie Betts being on the trade block all offseason long and now the Dodgers acquired him tonight... One of the things where Mets were like, Mets fans were like, we don't really need to get Mookie Betts because we have Steve Cohen and he's just going to sign Mookie Betts in free agency, no problem, because he has the money to do it. Well, guess what? Steve Cohen probably is going to be the owner. So now Mookie Betts is going to go to the Dodgers. Will he re-sign with them? Maybe. But now he's not coming to the Mets. And that's a really big problem because the Mets still are not going to have a center fielder, which they do need. They do need a two-way center fielder. They can't keep trying this thing of having these corner outfielders in center field. I've said it before, but we've had Granderson out there. We've had Cespedes out there. We've had Conforto out there. We've had Nimmo out there. None of them are two-way center fielders. You had Juan Lagares. He had a good glove. He had no bat. He can't stay healthy. So that has been a big problem. You have Jake Marisnik. He is a player that if he gets above 200 average, I'd be surprised, honestly. And who knows? He's probably going to get hurt, too, with the way things go for the Mets. So that is definitely a big problem. And the other thing that I think is even more important 
is the young core. Right? The guys you talk about, you know, the Alonzo, the McNeil, the Noah Syndergaard, the Brandon Nimmo, the Michael Conforto, the Ahmed Rosario. You know, you can go on and on with the, all the quality young players the Mets have, which really is still a surprise that they're in that kind of situation right now. But the thing that really has struck me and has really been on my mind is that the Mets really have got to trade Noah Syndergaard. I don't have anything personal against Noah Syndergaard. I know that I criticize him a lot because of his inconsistencies. And he's not lived up to the hype in my eyes. He's supposed to be this all-star Cy Young caliber guy. And he has not been that. He definitely has been inconsistent. And the numbers completely show that. But what concerns me so much is when I look at the contract that Garrett Cole just got of $325 million. If Noah Syndergaard is at least pretty close to what he's supposed to be, he's definitely going to get over $200 million. And the Mets, you know they're not going to give Noah Syndergaard the over $200 million because they didn't give Wheeler the $100 million plus that he just earned with the Philadelphia Phillies. So Noah Syndergaard is just going to walk away in free agency and the Mets are going to get nothing for him. And if I'm the Mets, I have to at least get something because the way I look at it, the thing that really bothers me about the Mets as well is that this is a pretty solid team. The Mets are going to finish the year with a winning record. But they're not going to make the playoffs and they don't have enough pieces to get to the playoffs and actually win in the playoffs. And I just felt that Steve Cohen, the thing that he could do was get that other piece or two, whether it was another reliever or starting pitcher or Mookie Betts or whoever, just that extra piece that gets the mess in the playoffs. And with the starting rotation that they had with Wheeler... They just had a chance in any playoff series. It's the same blueprint as when they went to the World Series in 2015. The good starting pitching just keeps you in every single game. So you never know what can happen. If the team makes a mistake or you get a big hit from one of your hairs, like the way Daniel Murphy did a bunch in 2015, then all of a sudden you could be in a World Series and potentially even win it. But now that Steve Cohen may not be the owner, that's going to be a lot harder to do. So the other thing that I'm really uh, being concerned about is Marcus Stroman because if the Mets have a bad year, a bad first half, they do really bad in June like they always do, you have to trade Marcus Stroman. I know it stinks because you gave up prospects to get him with the intention of re-signing him, but Marcus Stroman is going to get over $100 million, and the Mets aren't going to give it to him. Same thing with Stephen Matz. If Stephen Matz is just an ERA in the threes or even or maybe in the high fours with the way money is thrown around, he's over $100 million. So again, Mets aren't going to spend that money. What is Pete Alonso worth? He's worth over $100 million. What's Jeff McNeil worth? What's Michael Conforto worth? What are all these players worth as far as salary-wise? The Mets are still going to need another starting pitcher after Rick Porcello and Michael Watkins deals expire. They're also going to need another catcher once Wilson Ramos gets older and his contract expires. So there is so much money that the Mets need to spend just to keep the team intact. The team that still isn't even playoff ready, they still need all this money just to keep that team. So the way I look at it, I know it's not the popular opinion. It's not what I want to say. But the way I look at it is that I feel like the Mets have got to make some trades if the Wilpons are going to stay in the ownership because we know they're not going to spend the money to keep this team. So what you have to do is you have to trade a Syndergaard or a Stroman or whoever to get young pieces to then you know have them play on the cheap, on the low salary. Because the thing that I would hate is that if these next two to three years, the Mets are knocking on the door of the playoffs, but they never get there. And then once these guys' contracts run out, and they're free agents, and the Mets don't retain them. What I don't want to see is what happened, you know, from 2008 to 2015, where the Mets had this long strand of just horrible baseball where they're completely out of it. They have nowhere close to a winning record. They're not exciting to watch. They're not fun to watch, and they really, really stink. I don't want to see that happen again. And if the Mets do not make trades, and they just let all these guys walk away in free agency without replacing them, they're going to find themselves in that kind of situation again. I know it's. I'm probably overreacting. I'm probably panicking. I'm probably looking too far into the future. But I'm just being honest about it. I'm being frank about a sport. I mean, that's what the channel is all about. I try to be as honest as I can with the way I feel about these particular situations. And I just think with the Mets is that like you have to think of the Wilpon mindset. And that is to save money. So it just doesn't sound likely. You have to think of what is the worth and the value of each player. And I just don't think that the Mets are going to be willing to give. Think of how much money that would be for all those players. They're just not going to be able to do it. So I think that is just a big problem. And the other big problem is that the Mets have no farm system. They have traded away because they're in win-now mode. And they make these really weird deals. I mean, just things that don't help them win in the future. So all of a sudden, you're trying to win now. But then later on, 
all your prospects are going to be gone. I, I know I was very critical that you know, people were overreacting to Gamer to Kelenic, but he could turn out to be a star. And what if K is a good pitcher? I mean, you, you could think of so many what ifs with all the prospects that the Mets have gotten rid of. So, all that is definitely puzzling to me. You still have to pay Robbie Cano five more years at a crazy amount of money. So, that's not going to help your situation if you're a team that wants to save money. So, I definitely am concerned about the Mets. I'm definitely really concerned about the Knicks. So, it's just been a, it's been a tough time in sports as far as New York. Because we talked about the Jets and Giants, how bad they were. We talked about it during the Super Bowl podcast. The Nets, I mean, with all the injuries with Kyrie Irving now. He comes back, he gets hurt. Durant's been out all year. Even when Kyrie has played, the Nets have not played as well as you'd like them to. They're just barely hanging on to a playoff spot because the Eastern Conference is so bad. I just think that's really puzzling. The Yankees, they're in a drought for them. I, I still don't know how the offense is going to do, particularly in the postseason. You have to hope that Garrett Cole is that guy he was with the Astros. I'd worry about that. But let's talk about the Mookie best trade because this was really interesting. And the thing about Mookie was that we've been talking about all offseason that he could be traded, most likely the Dodgers, most likely the Padres. And this ended up being a three-team deal, and it was going to have to get creative because not only did the Dodgers get Mookie Betts, but they also got David Price. And David Price, you know, he got a crazy contract, which some people felt he did not deserve because of his performance in the postseason. But you know what? Uh, Price ended up playing well when the year the Red Sox won the World Series, so I think he does deserve credit for that. But still, the Dodgers, they had a part with one of their big guys. That was Alex Verdugo. That was one of their top prospects, a guy that they thought very highly of. Was someone they didn't want to include in a possible JT Rio Muto deal last year, I remember. So, you know what? You had to give up somebody to get Mookie Betts because I wrote about this for the Mets because I thought Steve Cohen was going to be the owner. But I just think there is value in having an extended sales pitch. And the Dodgers, they're really in win-now mode because they've been to the World Series a couple times in the past few years, and they just haven't been able to get it done. And like I said, for the Mets trying to get Mookie, you would think that hopefully Betts is that piece that gets you over the top and gets you to actually not only get to the World Series, but then win it. I mean, that's the mindset the Dodgers have got to have. Because they've just been so close so many times. They have not been able to get it done. And they have to capitalize with the good players they have. I mean, Clay Kershaw, he's getting older. And, you know, he definitely has his postseason struggles. And you have to capitalize when you have a Cody Bellinger. And you still have Justin Turner. And you have Corey Seager. The Dodgers, they have a lot of good pieces on their team. And you factor in Mookie Betts. So it definitely is a quality team. But the thing is that the Dodgers have the luxury because they still have other prospects. They still have... Um, Lux, they still have May, you know, they still have other prospects. They're still perfectly fine. And if that's what the Red Sox were asking for, the Mets couldn't even have pulled that trade off anyway because they don't have the prospects to do it. And like I said, they're not going to if they don't trade the guys they have. That's why it's just so important because you look at what prospects could do, they could get you these star players. And I think that's really important. And then um, for the Twins, they ended up getting um, Ketan I, I just think that that was a very interesting deal. I, I don't think it was too, too much, especially because you have a good chance to resign Mookie Betts. I know you take on David Price's contract, but the Dodgers, they're Los Angeles and they have the money to spend they're willing to do it compared to the Mets so I think that's really important and because an outfield spot is being taken up by Mookie Betts the casualty is Jacques Peterson who's going to be traded to the Los Angeles Angels pretty good deal for them the Angels they still have so much work to do they still have absolutely no pitching I know they got Anthony Rendon and they have Mike Trout and they have Madden as the manager but they really really need some pitching and Jack Peterson does not pitch he hits plenty of home runs he's a good player but they're going to need a lot more than Jack Pearson if the Angels want to be a competitive team again and actually want to get back to the postseason because they really have not been able to capitalize on Mike Trout's prime. So when you have these stars, you don't want to take advantage of them, but if you're a team that's not going to retain them, you have to keep your eye out for the future. So I, I think the Mets, I mean, if this Cohen deal really does not go through, uh, they're going to be in a really, really bad spot eventually. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. That would really stink to see the Mets, you know, finally get good again and then go back to being bad for a few years. That, that would not be good. One of the positive things that John Heyman said, you know, the deal isn't completely, completely off. Cohen hopes that the Mets will call him back. And one of the other real interesting things before I go, I saw a report that the Mets could be are in debt. I don't know if that's true. I mean, if it is, you really have to make sure that you call Cohen so he can give you the billions of dollars so you could pay off your debt and just be happy and have your money and not have to worry about the Mets anymore. Uh, that, that would definitely be advantageous for the Wolpons. 
but we'll see what happens. I mean, I just think that uh, Cohen probably feels like, you know, di- disrespected, I think is the word to use. Because, I mean, you had a deal in place, and then all of a sudden the Wolfpond's like, ah, just kidding. You know what I mean, like, that's really messed up. Think about it in life if you made a deal with somebody, and then you're about to make this deal. Then the last minute they're like, eh, well, maybe, you know, so-and-so. And you're like, whoa, what the heck? We had a deal here, and forget it, I'm out. Like, I can understand where Cohen's coming from, especially if he's a guy that, you know, when he gets what he wants, that's how you become a guy with, you know, $14 billion or whatever it is. So it definitely was a bit of a crazy day for the Knicks, for the Mets, for the Dodgers, for the Red Sox. And, you know, like I said with the Warriors, the way you could beat the Red Sox a couple years ago, they won, they were set a, a record franchise pace and they won a bunch of games, and they won the World Series. Then they missed the playoffs the following year. They still had a winning record, but they weren't that good. And now all of a sudden, they're just completely, it looks like they're rebuilding now. You had Klein Bloom take over, and he really went to a Tampa Bay mindset, which is, you know, save money. That is why, or just a side note, I would have thought the Mets should have hired Klein Bloom and not Brody Van Wagenen. I just felt that Bloom knows what he's doing. He's willing. He knows how to negotiate with a very small budget compared to Brody Van Wagenen. Just knows how to negotiate with players and you know try to make good contracts and what have you and get all the CAA agents. So that also has been a disaster. And I remember that Cohen was potentially going to get rid of Brody. And Luis Rojas, if things didn't go well once he took over. But again, if he doesn't, it really just changes everything. And it's just that's the way sports can go. Like, things could change like that. If you're the Warriors, if you're the Mets with the new owner, if you're the Red Sox, you just have to be careful. And I just think that when you're a team like the Yankees, I feel like you cannot take that for granted. And you have to relish in it. And you have to, you know, really appreciate it because there are other teams that they don't have it like that. And even if they do, It could be gone so quick. So I do think that Yankee fans do have to appreciate the team they have. I know they hold their teams at very high standards. It's championship or bust. But still, I just feel like, you know what? You could be the Knicks. You could be the Jets. You could be the Giants. You could even be the Mets where they've had two managers and they've had a new owner and they haven't had a new owner. So there's been a bunch of craziness going on with them. But until the next podcast, have a good one, everybody.